A reading from 1 Kings. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear you of your great name, your mighty hand, and your outstretched arm. When a foreigner comes and prays toward this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigners calls to you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God has never been all that keen on having us build a temple in God's name. In the earliest moments of scripture, when uh, this relationship between God and the people are formed in some of the strongest ways, especially at uh, Mount Sinai, uh, with the Israelites having uh, just left Egypt, uh, building a temple wasn't something that was a part of what God hoped for for the people. God rather hoped that God would be dwelling within them and among them. God would be known in their mind and their heart. God would be something that they carried around with them, trusted in every single day. It wasn't that God wanted them to build a specific place where they could find God because the idea was that God was with them wherever they went. Not necessarily here, not necessarily there, but wherever we are, wherever each of us dwell. That was the message that God wanted to get across to God's people. And so these commandments were put together, and if you remember, one of them says, you know, don't create an image of the Lord your God. So don't try to decide what God looks like. Don't try to imagine the specific thing that God must be like. Instead, just trust in God and know that God is here and know that God is with you. Probably because as soon as we decide that God looks one way or another, we can decide that things that don't look like that don't have anything to do with God. And I imagine that the whole uh, rule about not putting a temple together right away probably had something to do with if we start to think that God is specifically here or specifically there, we're going to forget that God is everywhere that we are. 
if we build up something that limits God or puts a boundary on what God is doing and where God is, we lose sight of the fullness of what God is about. And so, as the Israelites left the Sinai Peninsula and wandered around for 40 years, they never established a temple. They never built a specific place. They did come up with a little bit of a workaround. They took the tablets uh, that the law was written on, and they put that in a box, and then they built a tent around that, the tabernacle, and they built the tent the exact same way every single time. Now, it wasn't a temple. It wasn't a temple because you could take it down. It wasn't built. It didn't have a foundation. It was still mobile, and so they were still able to keep track of They were still able to keep track of, uh, there we go, <laughs> let, me, let me come back. They were still able to keep track of what God was doing in their lives, but they weren't distracted by God's specific location, because it was still a sign that as they traveled throughout the wilderness, and as they traveled into Israel, God was still with them wherever they went. God was still a part of their movement and their motion in the world. God was still a part of each and every one of their lives. And all through the period of the judges, those early days of uh, Israel establishing itself in that land of Canaan, and even up through Saul and David, there was still no temple until finally Solomon wore God down and God allowed this temple to be built, as Rick uh, read about just now. And when that temple was first built, that had the best intentions, the absolute best intentions about what a temple could be, because it was going to be this beacon of hope and light, right? It was going to be this thing that sort of towered above the land, and people from foreign lands would be able to look at it and be able to be reassured that God was present, and God was here, and God was real, and God had power. They were able to look at this sign of God's presence in the world and hopefully be reassured. And things went on like this for quite some time. But the trick when you build something specifically and say that God is there and always there is that when that thing goes away, sometimes you wonder where God is at all. You forget that God is present with you. And sure enough, that happened to that temple. It was blown to smithereens in 586 or something like that. And of course, when that temple was destroyed, and of course, when all of those Israelites were carted away from Israel to Babylon, it's a period called the exile, they had no idea who God was. They had no idea where God was. They were distraught because the temple was destroyed. The house of the Lord was smithereens and rubble. And if God isn't there, where could God possibly be? They forgot that marker that God is always here and God is here. And they built it up again, sure enough, over time and over the years. They built up a tradition of uh, reading scripture and carrying this scripture around with them wherever they went. And finally, they made it back to Israel. And then finally, they had the opportunity to build another temple. And this was a glorious temple. It was a beacon. I mean, the temple, they leveled a mountain to build this temple. And it was beautiful and gorgeous. And sure enough, in 70, after Jesus had died, that temple was blown to smithereens. And all of Jerusalem was leveled. And here we were again, trying to figure out what faith could possibly look like when that thing that we focused on and that thing we depended on was taken away. And we were shot back to Exodus, where we're just sitting in the field below the mountain, and Moses goes up and God says that our lives should be organized around God's living and active involvement in our lives. The laws and the rules and the guidelines that God plants in our hearts and in our minds rather than a specific place or a specific thing. Goes to show us that even when we gather in this place, it's a marker and a sign that God is everywhere. This is just more of a concentrated moment. I mean, we're best able, hopefully, uh, or at least better able, hopefully, in a place like this uh, to be able to recognize that God is present and God is with us in a very deep way. Not so that we only think that God is here, but that when we leave this place, we remember that God travels with us and that we remember that God is in all of the spaces and all of the places of life. If this place were to go, I hope that we wouldn't be uh, thrown into that moment of uh, darkness and despair when the temple went away, or the two temples went away. 
because we would be remembering that initial teaching of God that God is here and God is here more than anywhere else. I was recently uh, able to travel. Minda and I finally took our honeymoon after eight months. And as we were traveling, we went to a number of different churches. We were overseas. And so, of course, in Europe, there are these, you know, wonderful, wonderful, beautiful buildings um, who, which are designed to sort of shoot your mind and shoot your heart into the sky toward God. And you walk into these spaces, and they're just breathtaking. I mean, stained glass windows that go up to the ceiling, spaces that are so immense that you can't really see the other side. It takes, you know, 10 minutes to walk from one space to the other side. All built with the love and the idea that this would be a place that identifies God's presence and activeness in your life. And you go into these spaces, and I mean, we went on weekdays, and we went in the afternoon, so there wasn't always a worship service going on. And so even though in those moments there, wasn't, there weren't people gathered like you and I are right now, singing and, and praying and doing those things, it was still a place that highlighted that God is here, and God is present, and God is active. And I'll tell you what, it was a place also that highlighted the fact that this is a promise God's presence for all people, of all cultures, of all nations. Not everybody there spoke a particular language. Not everybody there had a particular faith. But everybody there was brought into a recognition of something that was bigger and greater and more expensive, expansive than our day-to-day. -day. And it fulfilled that original goal of what a temple could be, something that serves as a beacon, an announcement, a proclamation of God's activity and God's grace right here in our lives. But if that's the only place we feel it, if that's the only thing we look to, we're missing what God is trying to bring us to in the, at the end point, at the most potent, at the final moment. God doesn't want to bring us so close that we can get a sense of God's presence or just be reminded of it. God wants us to know God's presence in every moment. And the gospel reading today talks about what God's goal is. Not necessarily that we can go into a place and be reminded of God and maybe hopefully remind, be reminded of that throughout the week, but to carry God's presence with us. So that in our lives of faith, it doesn't really depend on a building or a sculpture or a table or a meal or anything like that, but instead, we're reminded of God's healing and transformation in each moment. So much so that the centurion in the story doesn't need to go to a temple, doesn't need to go to a synagogue, doesn't even need to be in the presence of Jesus for God to heal and for faith to be real. Often in scripture, we have a story of where Jesus goes to be with somebody who's suffering and be with somebody who is brokenhearted and downtrodden. And it's the presence of Jesus in that moment that is transformative. But in this story, the presence of God and grace is active even when Jesus isn't immediately right there. And why? Because Jesus dwells within us because God dwells within us, because God is with each and every one of us wherever we go. The centurion was never away from God. The centurion was never apart from Jesus. Jesus is that sign of God's activity in all of our lives. But God's work is done whether Jesus was in that room in the way that he wanted him to be or not. Jesus is with us right now, whether or not we can see him or recognize him or be aware of his presence. Jesus is with all those that we love who are downtrodden. Jesus is with all of those who are brokenhearted. God is active in every place all throughout this world. And it's not something that can be contained by a building or a structure or any kind of rule that we would apply to what God can do and where God will be. God is in all places, and God is in each of us. Even when we don't think we're worthy, even when we don't think that Jesus needs to trouble himself with whatever we're worried about, God is already there. Christ is already active. When we gather in a room like this, the idea is that in this moment, 
we'll be reminded of something that is always true, that God is here, that God is present, that God is now. And we're tempted to forget that that is true because this space seems like it holds together all of the faithfulness and all of the spirit and all of the grace that God is about, but it doesn't. Because God's grace is everywhere. God's grace is in all places, and most of all, God's grace is within us, working within us, working through us, transforming us from the inside out. When that centurion was worried about his friend, it was God's grace already active that made that moment powerful and miraculous. God's grace in laying out a way forward for those two friends to continue to be together. The same is true for each of us, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how we think that things are blocked off or delineated or closed. God is already there, opening things up, creating new possibilities, giving us life and revealing love. Wherever we go from this place, we need not limit God. God need not be limited to a particular way of holding hands or whether eyes are open or shut either. Because God is here. God is there. God is now. God is always.